Hello, everyone. My name is Andre Moritov. I lead the game analytics team at WB Games. And today I want to talk to you about how analytics helps games in development and how it helps user research. I'll go through a little bit about how analytics is set up at WB and some factors that make us successful in this uh, supporting role. Uh, I'll also give some examples of uh, interesting insights that we found along the way. Um, and talk a little bit about experimentation, which is sort of the next uh, frontier of uh, applying data science to game development. And of course, questions at the end. So who is WB Games? Uh, these are our studios. Um, and my team supports uh, all of them uh, during development. These span from free to play to premium, mobile and console. Uh, so we have a variety of titles in flight uh, at any given time. And, lots of opportunity to learn and to improve. Our last five or so years have been shaped by games like Arkham Knight, Injustice 2, Shadow of War, DC Legends on mobile, Mortal Kombat 11, uh, Game of Thrones Conquest, once we get on mobile. And we have some exciting new games coming up, Gotham Knights, Suicide Squad, and Back for Blood. And my team has been active in all of these and continues to be active in the titles that are currently in development. So how is analytics set up at WB? The larger WB analytics group, which my team is part of, uh, is composed of roughly three chunks. So we have the game analytics team, which, com which is composed of uh, game analysts who work closely with dev teams and with user research during development and during live ops to understand player behavior, to help drive improvements, as well as the experimentation team, which is the next step uh, in modifying player behavior and looking at ways to A-B test different features to find optimization opportunities uh, in, our, in our titles. Um, we also, under the same umbrella, include uh, integration support. Um, so these are folks who help studios onboard onto our technology and make it easier for them to send, collect, and analyze data. Uh, and we do competitive intelligence, which means we play other publishers' games and study them. The foundation of WB Analytics, which allows us to do what we do, is a, a common set of technologies that both collect data from games the same way from all of them, uh, a central repository of data, a warehouse, uh, so that all games have roughly the same KPIs computed the same way uh, and make them comparable, uh, as well as production support and, importantly, application development team. Now, the application development team is basically there to build tools for us as analysts to make us more efficient, more effective, and let us do things that we cannot do otherwise. They're a critical part of our success. There is also publishing analytics. Uh, this includes publishing uh, activity, sup analytics support for publishing activities like marketing, user acquisition, and in there is uh, CRM. Now, CRM is an interesting uh, opportunity for us because we can reach out to folks, uh, to live players. We can uh, run surveys. We can look for ways to explain what we're seeing in the data, uh, or vice versa, collect new data uh, to get better insight into what our players are doing. So the theme for all of these teams has been to combine data from different sources to construct a complete picture of what is going on. Uh, in a live context, you can think about, you know, your telemetry, user surveys, community feedback, uh, customer service feedback, there are many uh, sources when you go live. When the game is in development, there are certainly fewer, uh, but we can be much more focused in combining things like video, uh, telemetry, study results, et cetera. And so the keys to success and the, the keys to being an effective analytics organization have been the following. We build our own tech. Uh, I mentioned the application development group earlier. This is very key. Uh, the ability to produce our own tools as needed, when needed, uh, is very important and has proven valuable many times to us. Uh, our data visualization and exploration tools are just that, exploration. Um, we try to offer an experience where the end user, be it a level designer, or marketing person, or creative director, can look at a dashboard or a report and then you know, maybe answer the first of their questions, 
and then answer follow-up questions as they come up by exploring the data in a nice, safe, uh, controlled environment without having to write SQL, without necessarily having to uh, ask analysts to make minute changes. Uh, this makes the data interactive. Uh, it, it's, it makes it easier for folks to answer their own questions, and it makes it uh, data more of a partner uh, than a, you know, a, a report or something like that. Um, it, at the end of the day, this makes it easier for us to work with the dev team uh, and to prove our value. The central analyst group, um, I mentioned that we work with a number of studios, but the, the central analyst group is, is just that, we're central. Now, there are folks who are dedicated to a specific project, uh, but when they need help or in cases where, uh, you know, if there's a open data or, or a, a large analytical activity that needs to happen, uh, the central team swarms on that, uh, on that game or on that project uh, to bring as much insight as we can in a short amount of time. This also means that folks get to work on multiple games and move state of the art from project to project. So if we learn something on game A, any game subsequent to that gets to benefit from that learning. And thanks to user research, we get involved in games early. Uh, I'll go through some examples later, but one of them, we got involved in concept, uh, putting analytics into basically paper prototypes. Uh, so when games are still in development, they're really malleable, they're uh, easy to modify and change and improve, which becomes more difficult as, as the game ages and as it matures. So it's in our interest to bring insight as early as possible into the development process and bring as much of it as we can in a short amount of time. So analytics during development. What, is, what does this mean and how do we do it? So in a typical UR study, uh, what we've noticed is that, in, especially in modern games, which are more complex, think of open world scenarios where there's a lot going on. Um, you have observer reports and observation, and uh, the player's own sort of speak aloud and survey results. Um, but you, in order to understand them, you need to understand both what the player did in the game um, compared to their perceptions of what they did, as well as what the game did. The game has its own systems, its own behaviors. Uh, some can be very complex and not apparent just from watching the game. Um, so you can imagine player walking down the street there might be a whole bunch of stuff going on on either side of him off screen that affects or ultimately affects his behavior um, or the, the, the player story, the player journey. Um, but if it's not on screen, you can't apparent, it's not apparent, you can't see it uh, during a study. So we include this element of system behavior in our reporting. And so the, the ultimate result of uh, UR studies is usually a combination of, you know, traditional user research observations, commentary, uh, but also data that either supports or enriches those findings. Um, in cases where we find, let's say, contradictions, uh, where players believe they did something and according to the data, they did something else, that is actually the most interesting part. Because if the story the player is telling themselves is different from what they did, there are, there are legitimate reasons to look into this and opportunities to make the game better so that players understand better what it is they're doing. So where does the analytics team help concretely? Um, we break this down into a couple of camps. So observing the unobservables. Uh, I mentioned earlier, things could happen off screen. Um, and this is you know, the first point, random number generated or some other uh, non-deterministic system behavior. Uh, so if uh, your player is being dealt cards in a deck, the choice of cards will modify their behavior, but you don't know if what they got is a, a deck of very rare items, or if they even got the intended, the cards that were intended by the designer. So understanding this is you know, the first unobservable. Um, AI, uh, in games where you have uh, a complex artificial intelligence, which is there to make the game interesting, you need to understand what it's doing. Uh, you need to know if, if it's making decisions that support the play style that, we're, that design is trying to put into place, or if it's working against us. And as you can imagine, whether it's doing one or the other affects the appreciation score and other uh, user research results 
So being able to say why uh, or identify some causes of the appreciation score being one thing or another um, is, is very valuable. It's, it makes the insight a lot more actionable. We can quantify high frequency events. So if you can imagine a fighting game like Mortal Kombat, punch, punch, kick, kick, uh, you know, there's a variety of things all going on at the screen at the same time between two players. Uh, it's a lot. You, nobody can write that down. So, but we can record those events in telemetry and we can later, you know, during the analysis phase, uh, we can report on exactly which player did how many of which kick and punch and whether they used all of the options available to them or, or not. Um, and that leads to a deeper understanding of how players are differentiating in playing a given game, right? So you can classify people by behaviors. In a fighting game, you can you know, uh, think of players as being aggressive or defensive. In a first-person shooter, you can think of players being uh, kind of like uh, attackers or support um, players or medics. Uh, and so you know, they might choose uh, or self-identify as a given type, but their actions may be different. And we found interesting cases of that. And finally, what did the player not do? When you run them through the experience and watch them do whatever it is they need to do in the game, what are the opportunities that they missed? Uh, what are the spaces that did not go? What are gadgets that didn't use? We can report on that. And then during the analysis phase, so everything I mentioned before is kind of takes place during the actual study. Like it's just additional data that we're collecting uh, as the player plays. But in the analysis phase, we can do a couple of things. So we can find interesting moments in the data, uh, perhaps uh, an unlikely victory or a, uh, a particular choice of conversation options that we didn't expect. Uh, and we can drill into them. We can, we can literally pull up the video uh, corresponding to that point in time, just you know, by looking at the time the event happened, um, which means that it's a lot easier to start building uh, kind of a, a mental model of what the player was doing, right? So, okay, they did this thing that's unexpected. Why? I don't know. Let's look at some video, or let's look at other data, a, a focused chunk of data, uh, as opposed to everything that was collected. Uh, we can look for patterns, uh, trends, and outliers. Uh, so we've had studies where you know people basically behave the same, except for one guy who does something completely different. Well, knowing that is interesting. Being able to quantify it is interesting, um, but also obviously looking for reasons why uh, is extra interesting. Uh, but it starts with being about being able to identify those patterns and trends, as well as working with the design team to set some goals around them. Right, like how. What should trends be as players learn the game, as they master some of the techniques? Uh, should they uh, go wide? Should they use a, a lot of the tools, gadgets, weapons available to them? Uh, or should they specialize? That's sort of one interesting and repeating uh, pattern. And finally, we can measure improvements as get the game evolves. Right. So in a given study, let's say recommendations were made and uh, design has um, implemented them and we run another study to confirm the effect and we can measure it right we can say hey you know the appreciation score went up and the thing that we were trying to fix from the last study was actually fixed players are doing or not doing whatever thing we didn't want to or <laughs> wanted them to do uh, this is really powerful because it it confirms it sets up goal setting in the development process right we want 20 grenades thrown per hour of play Right now we have five. What do we do? Let's give them more grenades. Now we can confirm that, in fact, 20 grenades are being thrown. Silly example, but that's, that's, uh, that's the pattern. Um, so the value of all of this to user research uh, is, one, we tell the game's story. right? So we have the player side of things. Uh, we can also tell the games. We can corroborate participant feedback. We can correlate multiplayer sessions. So all of the data that's collected is collected per player, which means that if you have you know, two, three, four, five, ten 10 people playing together, you can look at all of them at the same time and find really interesting patterns in how they interact together. Are they all playing the same class? Are they all playing the same way? Is somebody lost? Is the group moving together? That kind of stuff. Uh, we can correlate observations to actions and vice versa. 
And finally, all of this means that we can make more actionable recommendations. By we, I mean user research and analytics together. Uh, we can we can give design more of a more of a target and a more quantified goal or benchmark to make decisions with. So let's get into that's the theory. Um, let's get into some examples from our last five six years of working with user research. So I talked about system behavior, and this is a really interesting one. Um, in an open world game, we had an appreciation study, and the report said something like that the game is repetitive and players didn't really understand the long-term goals. That sounds like a big problem. Uh, what do we do? Well, when we looked into what the players were actually doing, we found that most of them saw uh, three basic events uh, in the world. Now, there are more, but most people didn't see the more. They just saw the top, the top three that you see on the slide. And the interesting thing about that is those three are not the important ones. Those were essentially the filler uh, that goes between story missions or, or stories or missions that move the narrative and the player forward. So that's interesting. Uh, we did a, you know, you are picked this up. Um, we did a quick review of, of the data. Yeah, I mean, confirmed that's what people are doing. Now the question is why? What do we do about this? How do we make them see more of the other of the things that they should be seeing? Are the missions not interesting? Uh, are they not able to find their way there? There could be many reasons why they're not engaging with the more important content. Uh, so we looked at what the event spawner was doing, and uh, turns out the event spawner was not spawning any of the interesting missions, or under very narrow conditions, was not spawning them. Well, that's a much smaller problem. That's just Essentially, probabilities in an Excel sheet. We can change those, uh, and we can run. You know, we can confirm that we've that we are spawning more of those events, and make very quick fixes. So we went from a very large problem of, "Hey, our game is repetitive. Maybe we should rethink what we're doing here." To, "Oh, we're just not spawning enough of the right stuff." Easy fix. Quantifying high frequency events. Um, so this is another one. We had a mechanic in one of our games. Uh, it was called quick fire, but what it meant is you could uh, push a button. So the normal way to use weapons was to aim them, throw something, shoot something. But you could do a quick quick fire that was just one button. Uh, this was intended to be a, a like a getaway tactic, right? You, you throw something, run away, reposition, use your weapons properly from that point on. What we found instead is people were spamming the button, and on you know, in a if you watch the video of the participant, you know it, it looks like they're button mashing. So we're like, okay, are, do they not understand what's going on, or you know, why are they doing that? Um, and through interview, you know, through looking at the data a little bit deeper, and through interview, uh, especially interviewing the particular candidates who showed more of this behavior, uh, you can see the uh, gentleman or lady uh, in the third row um, did a lot of this. So what we realized is that they were actually using the quick fire mechanic as as primary attack, essentially. Uh, they later said, if they keep smashing that button, they'll keep putting out uh, ammunition downrange faster than they would using the normal way of using the weapon. Uh, and so what this graph shows is how many seconds there were between uh, quick fire events. What we, uh, so when we brought this to design, the feedback was something along the lines of, that's not what we expected. But it's kind of cool, you know. Okay, let's see where this goes. An example of what uh, players did not do. Um, you can see that in a given study, uh, players basically did not visit about a third of, or a quarter of the map. Um, now, why is that? Could be many reasons. Maybe there's nothing there. In which case, should there be something? Do people need to go there? Is is that content important and valuable, or is it a backdrop to? The other stuff that's going on in the in the in the level, um, you know, those are questions for design. But the important bit for us is to very quickly, at a glance, and for almost any study, for free without doing a lot of work, uh, we can say like, hey, okay, here's how people are parsing the space that you've given them. Is this what you want? Multiplayer correlation. So this is probably one of my favorites. The design question was, 
do players in our co-op game stay together? And if they don't, what causes separation? There, there could be legitimate reasons why people separate. Uh, maybe they're trying to flank the same objective. Uh, you know, maybe one has gone off to find a med pack or something like that. So we, we said, okay, let's measure how far apart people are uh, in a given study. And what's interesting here is uh, we had three studies back to back to back. Uh, in the first one, so what you're looking at in the graph is uh, basically distance between players at, in units, game units. Um, and so you can see the first one is, you know, they're pretty close together. There's some separation, but of course, some separation is expected. Uh, if you look at the second one, there are moments of very high separation. Um, and then if you look at the third one, uh, I mean, they're spending more time apart, <laughs> about as much time apart as uh, together. So what does this mean? Uh, you know, is which of these is the intended behavior? Can we set some goals around um, what people are doing and, you know, how should this game be played? And uh, the colors are important in that they cover different areas of the game. Uh, so you can compare area by area whether players are sticking together in that particular area. You can imagine some areas are corridors and you can't really be that separated. So this is a hard problem to analyze, right? Uh, answering why people do something that they don't may not realize they're doing is a little bit difficult. Uh, but what we can do is we can queue up some video to, to figure it out, or at least get some clues. So uh, in a dashboard, you can click a button, video pops up of both players together, and you can kind of see like, oh, you know, in some cases, totally legitimate. In other cases, uh, you know, they got lost, that, or that there's an obstacle between them and they cannot see each other, and so they don't know how far apart they are. Uh, what we also started looking into is, you know, are there telltale signs of in the separation, right? So if you look at the graph, uh, there are moments where they kind of separate and come back together quickly, but you can also have moments like this where they separate slowly, uh, right, and then reach max separation for whatever reason, and then, you know, run back towards each other. Now, is that because somebody went to find a med pack, found it, and got back? Yeah, maybe. Uh, we can watch the video and figure it out from there. But this this graph, uh, less than providing concrete answers immediately, was a really nice research tool to say, like, okay, well, to answer this question of whether people separate, we need to understand a little bit better, uh, you know, the collective uh, behavior that they're displaying. Uh, and this was a very helpful tool for us where you are. So um, I mentioned getting involved early. Um, so another favorite example of mine, uh, early, early in one of our games development, uh, there was a, a set of prototypes made in Flash. Uh, so you know, basically a step up from paper prototypes. Uh, there was no real game code written yet. Uh, all the prototypes were meant to do was test the meta of the game or the, the sort of the larger, the broad strokes of the game loop. Uh, in that game loop, there was a notion of uh, starting, you know, so the game went in cycles. You would go out, do a bunch of missions, come home, rest, upgrade, repair, go out, do a bunch of missions, come home, etc. cetera. Um, so we looked at in a, a very constricted scenario where uh, players literally just had a web page in front of them uh, with buttons to click uh, on which mission they wanted to pick and how they wanted to approach it, stealth or combat. Uh, and on the other side, they had uh, upgrades that they could buy, and those would improve their odds of winning a mission in stealth or in combat. No actual combat took place. I mean, this is just you know probabilities in an Excel sheet. Um, but we wanted to see how players make decisions in that context. And so uh, what we found was uh, players who uh, progressed faster, so the, the left side of the image here, uh, are folks who, you know, in few cycles, had advanced their level significantly. They were being more deliberate with how they chose to end their cycle. So uh, they would, you know, at some point decide that uh, they have had enough and they're going to go home and upgrade. Now, if you died during the course of going out and doing missions, same thing would happen. You would go home um, and uh, you know repair, refit, uh, but you wouldn't you wouldn't get all the you know uh, all the bonuses and, and uh, rewards for doing those missions. So we said, OK, so the desired behavior is that people are strategic about this, that they voluntarily choose to end their night instead of dying. Uh, 
because obviously. Um, and so the on the right side, we looked at the players who were lagging behind and took a long time to to progress. And what do you know? They were a lot. They were more likely to end their night by dying uh, than to do so voluntarily. And when we talked to them, you know, there were a few possible responses. People didn't know they could end their night. Uh, they didn't know that they, you know, they didn't think about the consequences. They didn't realize the difference in consequences between uh, dying and, and ending the cycle voluntarily. Um, so that was one interesting one. In the same set of prototypes, we also um, wanted to validate the the players understood the the way their upgrades would modify their their, their experience in the game. So the choice of you know sort of tech tree uh, progression. Um, and so we had you know we just looked at which stealth or combat option people chose. Uh, and there are many missions, so we kind of looked at the, the average. Um, and then we also looked at what upgrades they chose. And <laughs> interestingly, you know, we'd expect people to buy upgrades to reinforce their play style. If they choose to go stealth, they buy more stealth upgrades, they're more successful in stealth, and yeah, makes sense. Except that that's not what was happening. So people who went for combat would buy upgrades to improve their combat, and that part makes sense. But people who, about half of the people who played, uh, chose to play stealth were also buying combat upgrades and we you know we found that curious so you know i mean this was played by the dev team there was no uh no no game to to put in front of uh in a, in a ur lab at that point um and so the responses we got were you know there were a few different ones so um one was that people were they they intuitively this was not in the prototype, but intuitively they were like, well, I want to have the best combat because, you know, if, if I, if stealth doesn't work out, I need a backup plan. Uh, I, just, I want to be able to win, even in that case. Um, in other cases, people playing did not understand the relationship between their, uh, how they approach missions and how they approach gear. And finally, uh, there was sort of a dissonance in power fantasy, right? Like, so stealth sounds like a good way to go into a mission. Nobody will know you're there. You get the drop in everybody, right? That's how. That's how you would do it if you use stealth at all. Um, however, people still wanted the power fantasy of you know of having all the best combat gear and stuff like that. Now, given that this is super early in design, this is really important information because uh, if you start layering you know the, the sort of triple A visual richness and story and other elements uh, onto this loop, it becomes harder to read, not easier. So if people are having trouble at this stage. We know we have some work to do to make it apparent and, and make it easier for people to understand how they're supposed to use the game when those elements are added. So this is a really interesting sort of aha moment um, for, you know, during the concept phase and, and we could we could meaningfully change, meaningfully change the game uh, at that point. Measuring improvement. Um, so measuring the same metrics, uh, the, the nice thing about analytics is once you've hooked up events, most of the time, they don't change. Like the game might evolve, and some things might not matter anymore. But you can take any set of players and compare their data, which means that you can also compare a study A versus study B. Uh, you can confirm that a fix was made, uh, right? So if we did want to change something, we can confirm that that thing is fixed, and we can confirm that the fix had the desired effect on appreciation or usability or whatever uh, ultimate sort of high-level metric we're looking to improve. And we can find unintended consequences. Um, you know, we had cases where making one gadget more usable meant that everybody just used that gadget and the use of the other ones fell down. So like, yeah, that's maybe not what we want to do. Um, so again, you can start picking up on, on uh, things like that. And um, where that brings us is experimentation. So if we're saying that we can you know, run a study, make some improvements, run another study. Well, what if we ran two studies at the same time? Here's an example of experimentation in, in production on a live game. Um, we had a, a tutorial in a game, in a mobile free-to-play game. And uh, in that tutorial, we, we released two versions, uh, and they were slightly different from each other. The, the slight variation was that we would uh, allow people to play the sort of more advanced, unique selling point mode of the game from the get-go. And the other option, we would have them play a more traditional 
uh, mode of the game that might be more familiar. And then after some time, unlock the, the more advanced unique selling point mode. And so what we found is that the more traditional mode retains better early on. And being free to play, early retention is obviously important. Um, so, so we're like, OK, great. Now, could we have known this earlier? Could we have figured this out uh, a little bit earlier not uh, and gone out of the gate, like launched the game or with this knowledge and with already the right tutorial chosen? Well, yeah, I mean, probably. Um, we thought about doing A-B testing of that sort in a user research scenario, and we realized that we kind of already do that sometimes. And there's a specific use case where we do it a lot, uh, almost every game. So control schemes, uh, you might be familiar with this. So in uh, Arkham Knight, we, there are many different configurations uh, for driving the Batmobile. Here's an example of a study that was run uh, where players were asked to play one and then the other, uh, and then you know reverse them, uh, and then you know in addition to their feedback about how much they like uh, the, the config and how intuitive it was, we also looked at how many negatives negative effects of driving that they encounter. And once you normalize, you know for like hours played, a number of players and stuff like that, um, we come down to this, right? So the config number one is demonstrably low, demonstrably lower on uh, metrics like you know running into things. And, uh, flipping over, falling out of the world, uh, getting crushed by level geometry. Uh, so in addition to the qualitative feedback, you'd also say like, okay, so we compared these two modes on the same level, everything else held equal. Um, we experienced fewer negatives. This is probably the better config for people to get where they're going without running into stuff. So what if we could, what if we could do this? What if we make it a strategy to experiment uh, in our user study? Um, if we do that, we can control everything except for the thing that we're changing, hopefully, uh, because we're running the same version of the game. So, you know, we're not comparing, you know, the, the milestone five build with a milestone six build, which had a bunch of changes in addition to the thing we're trying to test. Um, we can measure the, the direction towards improvement. So if 20 grenades uh, is per, thrown per hour is the right indicator, and we test two different builds and they produce, you know, one produces five grenades per hour and the other produces 10. Well, we know whatever we need to change, the second build is closer to the truth. So let's, let's work in that direction. Um, we can iterate faster. And what I mean by that is uh, basically if we take the traditional cycle, right? So run a study, uh, report, find some things that we want to fix, design the changes, build, produce a build, et cetera, et cetera, run another study. This takes time. The game evolves, uh, and you get your insights. You know, after having run, you get the confirmation that you fixed the thing you wanted to after two studies. Hopefully, right? possibility that you didn't fix the thing you were looking for. Uh, if you experiment, however, and you run multiple builds at the same time, uh, you can, you know, you, you spend a little bit of work up front building out the A and the B and the C D F G options. However, once you run your study, you have a report that compares them, and Ultimately, in less time, you've arrived at a more actionable set of insights for the design team. How to successfully do this? Uh, we found that a few things are necessary. You need clarity of goals and hypotheses from, from the researchers, from the design team, because testing requires that you kind of know what you're testing for. And it, not every test, not every study has to be a test. But if you're trying to inform a very specific decision, it helps to know what that decision is. The experimentation and analytics tech should be integrated, goes without saying. Um, I mean, modern games have this stuff built in at some point. So if you get the analytics hooked up earlier um, and whatever system populates the game with data, you can run experimentation. You just have to get it in so that you can use it. And you need the developer to buy in to do the setup work, right? So there is more work to do A, B, C, D, and E, F, G. Um, ideally, those are just Excel sheets on a server somewhere, um, which are relatively easy to modify. Um, but they need to understand you know, how this upfront work is going to set, save time later on. And maybe you need to have a bigger sample, bigger number of people in the study. Um, you know, Ultimately, if 
if the study is too small, you might not find uh, that enough people have played A and B uh, to, to provide you know, reliable insight. So it changes a little bit the calculus for how you size the study. And finally, close collaboration between UR and analytics. Um, ultimately, this collaboration uh, is the, the one thing that has to work for, for the, the insights to be more actionable, to, for them to make sense to the developer, um, to have a complete picture. Right? We need to, to bring our worlds together, and, um, you know, do what we do best in service of the design team. And that's, that's my story today. Um, thank you for watching. I'm happy to take questions, um, and I'll talk to you soon.